um, this session will consist of, first of all, looking at the material properties that are outlined in EuroCAD 3. And um, we're going to look at connecting devices such as bolts and rivets and the, sort of the standards that sort of deal with those. Um, we're going to look at the cable and tension elements, and then we're going to look at the brittle fracture part of um, the code, which actually is a whole code, code in its own. So. Okay, um, starting off with um, the material properties part. Um, the material properties are covered in section 3 of the code and um, some of the partial factors are outlined on this slide here. And these um, partial factors take into account the variations in the material strength and the scatter of test results um, from a particular design resistance model. Um, so you've got the, sort of the various different um, partial factors um, given up there. Um, if you look at those partial factors, um, you will notice that um, if you've got a uh, cross-section um, that has excessive yielding, um, including local buckling, gamma m naught is actually 1 point naught, so you don't really have a gamma factor there. Um, and the reason for that is that um, well, one of the justifications is that the, the, a lot of the steel that's produced around Europe is actually exceeding um, the requirements of the code. And because of that, they've sort of said um, <coughs> that 1.0 is sufficient. Um, the other reason is because um, you also, it also takes into account strain hardening. And um, strain hardening will give you additional strength than you actually thought was there. And um, that's probably quite a good justification for the 1.0 factor. I'm not so sure that the justification that um, generally steel grades across Europe are sort of better than um, what, what you sort of specify as a really good excuse because half the time you can get some steel from China and it probably isn't. But um, the strain hardening one um, is, a, is a very good reason to take that into account. Um, the gamma M factor relates to resistances of members due to instability and um, it also applies to sort of shear buckling and things like that. Um, and then you've got the sort of gamma M2 value as well, which just deals with tension. Um, if you're dealing with composite beams, um, the same gamma factors uh, apply as um, you had for concrete. You've got 1.15 for steel and 1.5 for the concrete. And um, if you've got shear connectors, the um, gamma factor is 1.25. Um, you've also got another slide here um, that gives you some other gamma factors. And one of the useful things that you will find in the Eurocodes is um, First of all, it seems confusing that you've got lots and lots of gamma factors, but it is actually um, quite well set out because um, if it tells you that you use gamma 6 um, in the Eurocode, it means that you'll always use that one value. It's not like PS5400 part 3 where it's sort of, you have to go to the beginning of the code and figure out what gamma, fact, gamma m factor you're using uh, for that particular clause. Here it's quite um, clear that if you are um, dealing with sort of slip resistance or anything, it will tell you gamma M3 and um, that gamma M3 will be 1.25 and it will be 1.25 everywhere gamma 3 appears. So um, I find that quite useful and it's quite a good improvement over what we had previously. <coughs> um, this slide here just gives you the general properties for steel. Um, they are slightly different to BS500 but not a lot really. So the um, Elastic modulus is 210 MPa, um, and um, you use 210 MPa for both the steel and um, reinforcement if you're dealing with a composite section. And that's just a simplification that's been made, so you're not, not trying to sort of deal with this, your structural steel and your reinforcement. You both have slightly different elastic moduluses. Um, this has just been simplified and just tells you use 210 GPa for both your structural steel and reinforcement. Um, if you're using just a plain reinforced section, that will still be 200 um, GPA um, because that's what it says in 1992 um, for concrete design. But as I said, if you're dealing with a composite section, just use 210 um, everywhere. Um, your shear modulus is 80, 81 GPA. Um, your Poisson's ratio is 0.3. Um, your coefficient of thermal expansion is um, also slightly different to what it was previously. Uh, if you're dealing with only structural steel, it's um, 12 times 10 to the negative 6. But the different, difference lies in um, the concrete side of things. And concrete is given as 10 times 10 to the negative 6. Um, if you're dealing with um, sort of steel composite section, you probably don't want to be stuffing around with two different um, 
coefficient of thermal expansion, and the code has sort of thought about that, and um, therefore you're allowed to use the same um, coefficient of thermal expansion for both the steel and the concrete if you're dealing with a steel composite one. It's just um, if you're dealing with differential temperature, you use 10 times 10 to the negative 6. And if you're using with uh, direct temperature range, um, in, in that situation you use um, 12 times 10 to the negative 6. It probably would have been simpler if they just stuck to the one number, but um, they haven't. And this is what you are left off with. Um, if you are doing uh, composite design as well, um, there are slightly different limitations given on the concrete than was given in 1992. Um, and the concrete grades have to be limited between um, the C20 slash 25 and the C60 slash 75. And the reason that the concrete limits are a little bit lower than what they were in part two is because um, the lack of testing results for the very high grade concretes in composite sections. Um, and because of that, um, we have the, these limitations in there just because we don't know very much about the really high grade concretes, so the code doesn't really cover them. Um, this slide here um, just gives you the stress-strain um, relationship in the reinforcement. I won't talk about this too much more because it's exactly the same as it was for um, concrete. So um, Chris would have talked about that um, on the bit, section about material properties for concrete. <coughs> um, Eurocode 3 Part 2 covers um, steel grades with yield strengths up to 460 MPa. Um, you can use higher grade steels if you want to. Um, you can go up to S700 um, grade steels if you wanted to. Um, and, but if you're going to do that, you have to refer to Eurocode um, 3 Part 1, Part 12, which um, sets, it, sets it up a whole bunch of modifications to the other Eurocode parts um, for you to take into account um, the very high grade steels. Um, realistically, though, um, for bridges, we're not very likely to be using um, the S700 grade steels because they have the same fatigue performance as the sort of uh, normal grade steels that we use at the moment. And um, you, you just end up finding that the fatigue performance will dominate the design and therefore it probably isn't going to be practical to be using these um, high strength steels. But um, if you do come up with a situation where you need them, um, it is covered in Eurocode 3 Part 1, Part 12. <clears throat> um, if you're, you're dealing with a composite structure, um, you will end up with a modification factor um, to the to um, steel if you are dealing with um, S35 uh, with um, steel grades greater than S355, um, and that's just it just gives you some modified rules for the plastic moment resistance um, and for sort of the, the column resistance of the composite structures. And the reason that, that they've done this is just because um, it, you have to avoid concrete crushing from occurring. And if you get into the very high grade steels, you start running the risk of crushing the concrete. Um, and that's why that has um, been done. <coughs> um, again, in the same way as BS5400, if you've got different thicknesses of plate, um, the yield strength will vary depending on the thickness. So if you've got anything in excess of 60 millimeter thick plate, um, the yield strength will start decreasing as the plate thickness increases. And um, that's just exactly the same as BS5400 um, has done in the past, and I think it refers to the same euro norm as well. Um, uh, when you're doing your design, um, you'll probably need both your yield strength and your ultimate strength of your steel. <coughs> and um, the, these two parameters can be obtained in two places. The first one is um, Eurocode 3. Um, does have a section that gives some simplified values for your yield strength and the ultimate strength of the steel. Um, but you can also find it in product standards. Um, the Eurocode does um, state that this is a nationally determined parameter, so you can either use, or you can, basically it's, it's that um, you can either use product standards or the Eurocode, or you can use both. In the UK, um, what the National Annex says is that you have to use the product standard. Um, information. You're not allowed to use the, informa the simplified information in the code. Um, but again, that's something that, that can potentially vary between country and co country. <laughs> the product standards that do give you more accurate information there, so they're probably the better ones to be using. Um, there are also some ductility requirements given in the Eurocode. 
And uh, many of the design clauses um, assume that the material used in the steel components will be sufficiently ductile to enable the redistribution and ductile behavior after yield. Um, then generally, the minimum acceptable ductility requirements are recommended to be um, complying with these three of items here. First of all, that the minimum ratio between FUs or the FY is recommended to be 1.1. Um, in the UK, we've changed that and it's um, 1.2 instead. Um, you've also got a minimum elongation and you've got a minimum strain um, at the specified uh, ultimate stress in the steel. All those items are nationally determined parameters, so they can vary from country to country as well. Um, generally speaking, um, the steel grades that are given in Eurocode 3 Part 1 Part 1 will automatically comply with these um, requirements. Um, um, they've, they've, you've also got some requirements on through thickness properties. And um, basically, this um, is a problem that can potentially occur during fabrication when the section sort of cools rapidly and um, the shrinking of the weld metal um, can lead to development of large cracks um, or large tensile strains that lead to cracks um, in the plates in the through thickness di uh, direction. Um, <coughs> and um, that this phenomenon is referred to as um, laminar tearing. Um, to avoid um, this happening, um, the best way of dealing with it is just coming up with a good detail of um, sort of avoiding welding sort of really thick um, members to really thin members because the thin members start buckling around and can potentially end up with cracks in them. Um, so that, that's the absolute best way of dealing with it. Another way of dealing with it is by um, talking to the fabricator and the fa fabricator can give advice on these things um, and they can potentially also test the steel after they've fabricated it um, to figure out whether or not they've got these micro cracks. Um, <coughs> So this um, here is just um, how you would go, then go about calculating whether or not you've got a good or bad detail. Um, in the UK, um, we don't, we're not actually allowed to use this method, but um, I will go through it anyway now because um, it, it's quite a good way of, for you to start looking at a detail and figure out whether or not it's a sort of good or a bad detail. Uh, as I said earlier, um, probably the best way of dealing with it in the UK is talking to the fabricator and finding out what they think. Because the problem is, if you do apply this um, sort of section mindlessly, you can potentially end up with a very high um, Z grade of steel. And um, high Z grades of steel are very expensive. And most contractors won't be very happy if you try to specify them. Because uh, some, of, some of the really high grade ones are quite difficult to get hold of as well. So um, if you've got a poor detail and you have, absolutely have to use that poor detail, um, that's where talking to the contractor might come in handy because they might be more willing to just um, fabricate the piece and then do testing on it afterwards just to check that they don't have a problem uh, rather than try to procure the high, really high Z um, grade of steel. And as I said, testing it is a perfectly valid um, method, method as well. <coughs> but anyway, as I said, I'll just go through how you would sort of assess um, a detail. Um, <coughs> Basically, um, the, the sort of Z grade of steel is based on a numerical value of ZED, and um, you can ig ignore the effects of laminar tearing if you can justify that your ZED is less than or equal to ZRD. Um, ZED is um, calculated by um, cal uh, summing up all these um, Z factors, ZA through to ZE, and um, those Z factors are sort of derived from table 3.2 in Eurocode 1993 part 1 part 10 and that just tells you how the sort of different requirements for each um, section. Once you've actually calculated what your ZED value is, um, you then go over to table 3.2 and um, table 3.2 um, will tell you the sort of Z grade steel um, that would be required. So um, if you're dealing with a ZED of less than or equal to 10, then you don't have to worry about it too much. Laminar tearing probably won't be a problem. But if you've got a hot, really high ZED value, you will end up with very high Z um, grade steels and, poten and potential problems in it. Um, <coughs> this now is just going through an example of um, 
just putting basically just putting numbers in the equation. Um, and basically here we've got our sort of a, a middle flange plate which is slotted around our girder web. And um, that's done despite the good practice to slot the thicker plate through um, the thinner plate. So um, going on into here, um, we then have to sort of first of all calculate um, the effective area of the plate, um, which is um, 10 millimeters. So if you went back to um, this table over here, um, you, you go up here um, in sort of section A, and you find that if you've got an A effective of 10 millimeters, it means that you've got a, a ZS of um, some hidden value there because I can't see it. It is, it is um, a ZA factor of three. Um, you can see it in your notes. Um, the second thing you would do um, is look at your um, ZB factor. And um, for this situation, we've got a multi-run fillet weld. So again, we just refer to this um, table. And for multi-run fillet welds, we've got a ZB value of zero. Um, the next thing we look at is um, the ZC factor. Um, we've got a half joint web thickness of 16 millimeters. And again, we just read off this table. We've got 16 millimeters. Um, so ZZ, ZC rather, is equal to um, 4. Um, the ZD value um, will, is dependent on whether you've got um, restraint into the section. Um, in this case, we don't have any sort of restraint. We've got free shrinkage is possible within the section. And because of that, um, ZD is equal to um, zero. And um, then you finally got ZE, which is um, dependent on whether you've got preheating in the section or not. And um, in this case, we don't have any, we haven't applied preheating. So the ZE factor is um, zero. Um, so the next thing that we do, um, we just add up all these values. And um, we end up with a ZED value of 7. So um, looking at that detail, it's less than um, 10, um, according to the table 3.2 here. And that means that you don't have uh, Z um, quality steel, so the detail is um, OK. So as I said, this is just a good method to assess whether or not you've got a reasonable detail or not. But uh, um, in the UK, um, it's actually specified in the National Annex not to use this me method. And instead, it basically tells you to go talk to the contractor or the fabricator and um, get their opinion on, about it. And that's usually the best option anyway, because otherwise you end up with very high grade steels um, that are very expensive. OK, um, going on to um, tolerances. And the dimensional tolerances. Um, on rolled se sections, hollow sections, and plates I do have to comply with the relevant product standards. And this is to ensure that the variations from the nominal dimensions are properly catered for by the Eurocode 3 material partial factors. Um, if you've got a section that's fabricated through um, welding, um, there are some additional tolerances that are given in EN 1090, which is your execution standard for steel. Um, you've also got tolerances on plate thicknesses and cross-section dimensions, and um, those do not need to be considered in your structural analysis. Um, but other fabrication imperfections, such as the straightness of struts, um, do need to be included in the, in the structural analysis if you've got large second-order effects. And um, these sorts of tolerances are also included in the sort of buckling curves that are given in the Euro curves. So, Um, yeah, so as I said, you, you've also got these other sort of imperfections such as the straightness of the struts um, that um, if you don't comply with those tolerances, you're not complying with the buckling curves as well in the code. So you have to be careful um, if you don't comply with those, basically. <coughs> um, connecting devices, um, this includes sort of bolts, welds, rivets, um, things like that. Um, the, the rules given in Eurocode 3 Part 2 for the design of bolts um, does assume that the bolts, nuts, and washers comply with all the relevant um, product standards as well. Um, these grades are given on this slide here are the grades that are covered by the Eurocode. 
Um, and the, the nominal values of the yield strength and ultimate tension, tension straight, strength are given for the, um, all, all these gra grades of bolts. Um, the grade 8, 8.8 .8 and 10.9 um, bolts are the high strength bolts with preloaded connections. And um, in, this cases, in these cases, the tightening has to be done in accordance with um, EN um, 1090, which again is the execution standard. Um, you are also allowed to use rivets in accordance with the Eurocode. And um, if you are specifying rivets instead of bolts, these have to comply with um, the design in EN 1993 part 1.8. Um, you'll be seeing you know, EN 1993 part 1, part 8 quite a lot when it comes to connection design. And that's because um, that code is the one that just deals with all connections. It's a nice big 180-page um, code as well. <laughs> and um, we'll talk about that a bit more tomorrow. Um, welding, um, here you also actually do the design to EN 1993 part 1, part 8. And um, you have to make sure that you comply with the relevant um, material properties, which again are given in um, the various product standards. And generally speaking, the mechanical properties of the world have to be the same as for the parent plate. And um, there's no difference there to what we've done previously. It's pretty much exactly the same. Um, the next. Sorry, is this the same as the steel is covered by the What? The same as I can't remember if stainless steel is covered or not. You'd have to look up the code, basically. Um, okay, going on to cable and tension elements. Um, the Eurocode has a special part that deals with um, cables and tension elements. And this is Eurocode 1993 part 1, part 11. <coughs> and that, that covers both the adjustable and the replaceable um, components in our sort of tension element. Um, so it deals with sort of cable, cables in a cable stay bridge, for instance. I've um, got three different um, types of um, sort of tension elements. Um, the first of these are the tension rod system, which co comes in under group A. And these are, include things like um, bars with a solid, a solid cross section, which are connected to um, end anchorages. Um, for these ones, you've got a fairly high um, elastic modulus. It's 210 um, GPA. Um, you've got a second group, um, group B, which can, comes in on, on the ropes. And this includes things like spiral, spiral strand ropes and fully locked coil ropes and um, strand ropes that are composed of wires which are anchored in sockets and or other types of end connections. Um, there are some further definitions given in the notes, but they all consist of um, helically laid wires, basically. Um, and for these types of um, sort of tension elements, um, the young elastic modulus will vary um, depending on the load, and it, um, it is generally cons considerably lower than for the tension rod system. And um, we finally got the group C um, type. Um, tension elements, and this consists of bundles of parallel wires or strands, um, and these need um, all in all need individual or collective anchoring and individual or co um, collective protection. Um, the elastic modulus here is um, obtained from either IEN 10137, or there are some recommendations given in Eurocode 3 Part 1 Part um, 11, and those are the ones given on this slide here where the elastic modulus is equal to 205 plus or minus 5 at GPA for bundles of parallel wires and the 195 GPA plus or minus 5 um, if you're dealing with a parallel strand. <coughs> um, Eurocode 1993 part 1 part 11 also covers analysis of the cable supported um, structures and that includes the treatment of the load combinations and um, the treatment of any nonlinear analysis that you might need to do. Um, if you've got, um, generally speaking, if you've got a cable stayed bridge, um, you will have some nonlinear effects um, in the cable sag, and this can be accounted for by using um, the Ernst equation. And the Ernst equation is the one that's sort of given up here, and that just takes you, lets you take into account the fact that um, 
if you have a cable stay element, it'll always have a slight sag um, in it. It'll never be completely tensioned up. And um, you will end up losing a, a certain amount of stiffness due to that. And that equation there just allows you to take that into account um, if you're doing your calculations for it. Um, now moving on to um, brittle fracture. Um, basically, the Eurocode 3 requires that all steel material has sufficient toughness to prevent brittle fracture from occurring. Um, and brittle fracture is covered in um, Eurocode 3 part 1 part 10. Um, so it's got its own code dealing with this. And um, generally speaking, you have two main items that you consider when you are looking at brittle fracture. Um, the first thing is the minimum pe temperature, and um, then you'd consider the maximum tensile stress occurring at this temperature. Um, there are also various other um, effects that um, affect the um, brittle fracture component, but that's dealt with by sort of varying um, the minimum pen temperature and the sort of ten tensile stress. It's all um, built around sort of varying those sorts of things. And these other factors include things like the crack, um, crack types, strain rates, um, residual stresses, the shape of the item that you're considering, and if you've got any cold forming within the section. <clears throat> um, the general design approach that you'll use um, for each bridge component is to calculate, first of all, the minimum reference temperature, which is given as TED. And um, after that, you calculate the associated stress in the component. Um, after that, you then establish um, suitable steel grades for the component um, from this table here. So um, you have a reference temperature, you've got a steel grade, and then you'll um, just read off that um, table to find out what your maximum um, thick element thickness is so that you won't have any brittle fracture um, issues. Um, if, as long as you make sure that um, all the fatigue details on the steel component are covered, um, properly in accordance with Eurocode 3 part 1 part 9, which is the fatigue part of the code. Um, <coughs> um, the, generally speaking, particular details won't be an issue. It will just be the overall element um, on its own that um, could be a potential problem, and it's any overall element that you have to check for brittle fracture. Um, one thing I did forget to mention at the beginning of this um, session is that there are an awful lot of parts associated with Eurocode 3. Um, this sort of I think there's 12 different um, Eurocode 3 parts, and then you've got the, uh, an additional part for steel bridges. So I'll be jumping around, sort of mentioning quite a lot of different um, sort of codes, which may initially seem a little bit confusing, but um, it is actually quite logical the way it's set out. It, it generally, each code deals with a different um, element on its own. So it's not as bad as it looks at first glance. <coughs> Um, the approach for assessing the brittle fracture is um, only intended for new construction. It's not intended for assessment at all. Um, <coughs> and um, the design approach basically involves, first of all, calculating TED and its associated stress, and then um, taking, calculating suitable steel grade. Um, the calculation parameters are as follows. Um, to calculate TED, um, you have all these various um, T factors that um, come into it, and that takes into account um, all these uh, factors that we mentioned um, previously. So um, going on and looking at those in a bit more detail, um, first of all, we've got um, TMD, and this is just the lowest air temperature with a specified return period. Um, you've got delta TR, which is just an adjustment to temperature to take into account um, any radiation loss. Um, you've got delta T sigma, which is an adjustment temperature to take into account um, the stress and the yield strength, strength of the steel. Um, delta TR is just an adjustment temperature um, to allow the designer to um, sort of adjust it for different reliability level, levels. And then finally, you've got um, uh, delta T um, epsilon, which is an adjustment factor to allow for unusual rates of load, loading. Um, generally speaking, most transient and persistent design situations are covered by a reference temperature of 4 times 10 to the negative 4. Um, however, you probably won't usually know the strain rate um, when you do a calculation. Um, so if you look at the Thomas Telford um, notes, you'll find that they generally recommend um, halving the steel grade thickness 
uh, when you have an impact. And um, that's basically just consistent with what was in BS500. Um, you will find there are an awful lot of par parameters in this. And um, first of all, it does look um, quite confusing and quite complicated. But you will find that when you actually start doing a calculation on these parameters, most of them come out as being zero. So it's not too bad, really. Um, it, Eurocode 3, part 1, part 10 is um, quite a complicated looking code, generally. And that's mostly because it was written by a fraction mechanics expert. And um, he didn't actually do any practical design. So it's kind of centered around someone who's very, very <coughs> theoretical. And um, you, you will find when you start using it, it's not terribly practical to use. But um, as I said, a lot of these things do come out as zero when you do try to apply pra practical numbers to them. So it's not quite as bad as it looks um, when you first start out. Um, the stress part of the component, um, which is sigma ED, um, will be calculated at the reference temperature and should be based on the um, principal stress, though um, that's not actually stated in the code itself. Um, and it should be calculated from this combination of actions given here, where ED equals that huge mass of things there. Um, <coughs> basically, if you look at that equation, it's essentially an accidental um, combination where the temperature has been taken as a leading action. And um, the effects of temperature um, do need to take into account um, any restraint due to the temperature movement as well um, when you do the calculation. Um, in the UK, um, there was some concern um, that was raised during the drafting process about um, potential excessive benefit of um, using this method if you've got low stresses. And um, basically that concern arises because um, residual stresses from fabrication tend to do dominate low applied stresses. But um, Eurocode 3110 um, gives a large benefit when you have um, that sort of situation. And um, because of that, in the UK, um, the National Annex requires sigma ED to always be taken as 0.75 times the yield strength of the steel. <coughs> If you do have an applied stress of less than 0.5 times the yield strength, um, delta TR can be increased to compensate for that. Um, so um, this is another area where we depart slightly from the Eurocode, and you will have to start using um, the National Annex just to make sure that you are complying with the UK rules. OK, um, now we'll just go through a quick example on this, um, just to sort of illustrate exactly how many of these parameters will come out as zero and also how you would actually go through the calculation. Um, so we've got our sort of our overbridge section where you've got our potential impact from vehicles. Um, we've got bottom flange thickness of 40 millimeters um, with no stress concentrations. And um, we can therefore calculate that um, PMD plus delta TR is equal to negative 12 um, degrees. Um, we've got a project specified strain rate uh, which is 1.7 times 10 to the negative 2 per second. Um, however, um, if you don't have, if you haven't been given that, um, there is a simplified procedure that we sort of discussed previously of just using half um, the, the thickness of the section in the court, uh, in the same way as we've been using for 5400. Um, the stress in the bottom flange um, has to be taken as 0.75 times the yield strength, um, and again, that's just a UK requirement. You always have to do that. Um, from now going into the code, um, we then calculate what delta, C, delta T sigma is. Um, you go into a very, the, so that clause in the code that's shown there, and you actually find that equal, equals zero. Um, you then have delta TR, which again um, equals zero, um, and then go on to delta T epsilon. Um, because we do have the strain rate, rate in this situation, um, we can calculate what it is, and we just put the numbers into the equation and come up with a delta T epsilon of 14.5 degrees. <coughs> um, we then just um, add all these components together um, and come up with a delta uh, T ED of negative 26.5 um, degrees. <coughs> uh, we then go back to that um, table, uh, which is um, the, this table here, and we just read off um, from there. Um, to find out what our maximum um, steel grade is. So um, if you've got um, a TED of negative 20, 
um, you end up with a thickness of um, 50, um, which is just shown there. And if you've got a del uh, delta T B of negative 30, you end up with a, um, a maximum thickness of 40 millimeters if you look at the S355 J2 um, steel. <coughs> so interpolating between that um, for our particular steel, we end up with um, a 43.5 um, millimeter sort of maximum. <coughs> and um, in this case, because we're using a 40 millimeter piece of steel, um, it does comply with this requirement. <coughs> 